So now that we've examined our design at various stages of compilation, it's time to take a look at how it's physically implemented on the device. For this, we need to use the Chip Planner. The Chip Planner is an incredibly powerful tool which isn't just used to view designs, but can also be used to manually map and route designs to specific primitives on the device. It's for this reason I suggest you don't play around with it on anything but a backup copy, as you run a serious risk of messing up your design. That said, let's go ahead and open the Planner. The first thing we're presented with is our FPGA device itself. It looks quite similar to the representations that you've seen in earlier screencasts. It's split up into different blocks, representing things like I.O. and logic elements. Using the chip planner, we're able to zoom right in to view the discrete primitives. On the edge here, you can see that we've got some I.O. banks. These green lines are our memory cells. In the top left corner of the device, we've got a large area taken up by some hardcore flash memory, which is pretty handy on a system like this. It means we don't have to waste valuable gates and memory cells to store information. The majority of the device is taken up by these blue cells, which are complex logic blocks. Each logic block contains 16 individual logic elements, and it's these which are used to implement our design. As our design is small, we can quickly identify the logic blocks relating to it, as they are shaded a deeper blue than the rest. Looking at the chip, we have two blocks which are shaded, one containing the logic for our module, and the other acting as a ground line, as we saw in the technology map. We'll zoom in on one of these blocks. You can see that the specific logic element being utilised is also shaded. If we double click this element, we'll get a view of its internals. As you should hopefully recognise, this is an RTL view of the inner workings of a logic element. We can see here that we have four input lines going into a lookup table, with the resultant sum of products expression being passed out of the block, presumably with some I.O. in this case. On the top right, we have some registered logic, which can be switched to use the lookup table output through a multiplexer. We'll be coming back to look at this later in the semester. In the pane underneath, we have a list of the element's ports and the signals in our design that they're connected to. You can see here that all inputs are disconnected, except for data lines C and D, which are connected to inputs A and B from our simple logic module, respectively. It's worth noting at this point that the data lines can sometimes be inverted depending on the logic element being used. So if you see an exclamation mark in front of the lines, then you can assume that the data is inverted and therefore the lookup table equation will be different from what you expect. So we've got a two data lines coming in, going into the lookup table. Now if we have a look at the window on the right, we can see that the properties of our lookup table are detailed here. We're interested in the sum lookup table mask, which has a value of F000, and the sum equation, which is displaying as C and D. So let's see if that matches up. So if we start with our lookup table mask of F000, doing a quick conversion into binary gives us a value of 1111, followed by 12 zeros. So that's the mass for our lookup table. So if we have a look at the lookup table itself, we have our four inputs. Notice that I've reversed the order in our truth table. This is because for the lookup tables, A counts as your least significant bit. So you can see we've got D, C, B, A. Now if we take this lookup mask and transpose it into the lookup table, so starting from the least significant bit, so zero 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 one 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 one. We can see here that our values are one each time that C and D are one. 
So a good skill to have is to be able to look at these lookup table masks and actually translate them into the truth table for the logic elements. I mean, yes, it gives you the lookup table equation in that properties window, but you want to be able to do this manually as well. As this is a simple design, we weren't really expecting too much of an issue here. But as your design grows, it's good to see how they're implemented. Remember, any combinational logic with four inputs or fewer can be represented by a single logic element, regardless of how many gates it has. If we go back to the chip planner, we can add a couple of layers to the view to get an even better look at the internals of the device. By adding global and local routing to the view, you can see that the row and column interconnect architecture appear. We can see the local interconnects, which connect logic elements within a CLB, and then the global interconnects, which connect CLBs to each other, as well as the I.O. memory banks, memory cells, and other device features. By turning on the port layer, you can see the individual connections to each logic block. So in theory, we could follow our signals path through the device, from input port to logic to output. We'll now take a look at one of these I.O. ports. You can see that we have a physical pad here connected to an input buffer. Looking at the bottom of the window, we can see that this pin is the input port for signal A in our simple logic module, which comes in at the pad, goes into a buffer, then out towards the logic element. The next pin in the bank is our B signal. So when we come to implement a design on the board, we'll be manually assigning pins to the port that we want. Some pins have special dedicated functions like clocks or are connected to external peripherals, so it's very important to know what each pin is physically connected to on the board. As your design gets bigger, you'll no longer be able to assume where specific pins or logic elements are located based just upon the cells which are shaded, so we want a way to jump to the specific signal or logic element depending on what we want to view. Luckily, we can do this through the technology map viewer. For example, if we wanted to check exactly which input buffer this signal had been mapped to, we can just right-click on it, select Locate Node, and Locate in Chip Planner. So if you ever want to see exactly where these primitives are on the device, you don't have to search through 40,000 logic elements to find them.